Good afternoon. Uh, I hope that this would be as interesting and would be an inspiration to everyone. As, uh, as your fellow uh, student here before the university and fellow uh, graduate, I want to present to you this agricultural interpretation, which I believe is our pathway to progress. Well, definitely we have to define first what entrepreneurship is all about. An entrepreneur is one who undertakes innovations, finance, and business acumen in an effort to transform innovation into economic goods. This is the very basic essence of everyone's, I think, idea of what life is all about. We must have that economic return for everything we do. Agriculture entrepreneurship as an initiative, it can change how we utilize available resources while creating new opportunities and solutions. This is where an entrepreneur differs from an ordinary businessman. He can change and create. Now, let us look at our current agricultural situation. Why do I say that we have the best opportunity in agriculture? As you can see, this is just to show what happened already to our mountains and forests. Here we, I will show you the uh, recent, this is the second quarter of 2010, of what, how, our, uh, how agriculture stands. We are, in the, in the, for the national income, for our GDP, agriculture is negative three. For employment, for agriculture we have a negative 803,000 unemployed in the agricultural sector. So you would see, that there's a lot of problems occurring within this uh, area. So if there's a problem, then there must be an opportunity. This is how I look at things. Now, you could also see the declining growth rates by commodity. This source was uh, 2003 from David Abito and Brianna, split with agriculture for the years. As you could see, palai corn, coconut sugar, we're on the downtrend. Our fisheries is also in the downturn, and forestry is at this month, negative minus 1.5. Now, we also have a good yield growth for major crops. For rice, you can see, we are only 1.2. For coconut, definitely, it's a 2.8. And for sugar cane, it's minus 0.08. These are the uh, sources that we have. Now, the most alarming is the forest degradation. Our Philippine forest figures is that forest covers total forest area is 7,162,000 hectares. Percent of land area is 24%. Primary forest covers 829,000 hectares. Percent of land area is 2.8%. Percent of total forest area is 116 so if you look at the deforestation rates from two, two, year 2000 to 2005, you would see this, uh, we have a loss of minus 32.3%. So this is a big problem for everyone, not only for our country, not only for our community, but for the whole world. But let us just concentrate on the local issue, on the domestic issues. Here, I would like to show you also, this was reported by Dr. Abel Al Alcala from Sliman University during uh, the PCCI con conference on biodiversity. You would see that the Philippine marine habitat and biological resources situation. Our mangrove for 400,000, now it's only 100,000. There are 16 species that should be saved, as he mentioned. 69 species of out of 23 families. Our coral reef, which is around 25,000 kilometers, 5 to 10 percent are in good condition. This is the only thing left for us. Our tuna harvest, tuna from 300k to 500,000, now is only 200,000. Our coral fish, from 350,000 to 177,000. 90 to 95 percent of the fish in the reef area are lost in the biomass. That is per square meter basis. 
So you would sum the losses we have due either to the uh, destruction of man or natural uh, calamities here in the Philippines. Now, the question is now what can be done to address these alarming agricultural issues? This is one thing that each and every one of us should be concerned of. Every student, every person here in the Philippines should be concerned. And I think every person in the world must be concerned about this. So what can we change and create from these key agricultural issues and problems? Our company says, uh, made a certain a program, our corporate social responsibility, in order to do some changes and create something out of this problem. Conceivably, we can change the way we use and protect our natural resources. We can change the way we nourish our families. We can change the way we develop our communities. And we can change also the way we meet the need of our society. This is essential because there are many ways that we have to address to protect our natural resources. Generally, what we do is uh, we answer the question of how if we see a deforested area. We always ask, how shall we bring it back? But we never ask the question why it happened. So with all the programs that the government is doing, we could not really succeed because we only answer the how. If there are no trees, let us plant trees. But the very essence of the problem are the people in the community inside. As long as they do not eat three times a day, they do not live comfortably, we cannot protect our natural resources. We could also change how we nourish our families, definitely. Because it's the only thing that they could have. So they have to devour and destroy everything that's, that's around them. And then here, we have to change the way we develop our community. We must, I believe, empower the people and the community in order that they would protect the environment that they live on. And then, we must meet the needs of society without compromising the environment. Now, what can we create? We can create ways to solve problems and create values. We can create ways to do business. We can create jobs, products, and services. We can create wealth. Our modest company have tried to work on this creation. To solve problems and create values, to do business, in order that, in order that we produce this one. This is the essence why people work. Not really of wealth, but definitely to survive and to be sustainable and live comfortably. The bottom line is, we need to focus on three critical factors if we want to develop agricultural entrepreneurship. We have to deal on productivity, efficiency, and sustainability. Now I'm going to show you a project that we did in Atisan, San Pablo City. Here, I'd like try to see the require from an agricultural and definitions perspective. So this is how we look at things. This, this is a community like the hotel that we uh, did in Barangay at Intel San Pablo City, Laguna, Philippines. This was a marginal land. We started with this marginal land. And a lot of erosions and destruction in this area when we entered this place. So it's definitely a zero productive land. So here, this is the profile of uh, Barangay Akisan. The key challenges in community livelihood program is this. There's a predictable prices of products they produce. The, secondly, they lack the capitalization because they do not reach the credit facilities from the banks. And no has definitely would give them credit because of their situation. Lack of knowledge, know-how of plants that can be profitable. So they would only grow crops that would be they feel is available in the area without knowing whether this would be profitable for them or not. 
and then they're very dependent on single source of income. One plan they do, or one thing they do, they will just depend on that for the whole year. If they want to make charcoal, that's the only right people they do. So they're going to wait for the next time again, when summer comes, where they can make charcoal. And then, management of their source of income. Normally in this area, once they have money, they don't know how to allocate this money and use it properly. So this is one of the biggest problems of our community in the Philippines. <coughs> so here, what we did is we had an economic and environmental program. We implemented this in the year 2004. First, we saw the area that uh, it is uh, denuded, very marginal. So we asked the help of the Source Department of the University to help us do something about it. And to our dismay, we, we, the uh, marginal land that we had, they surrendered to this uh, problem. They said, it's so hard to make something out of it because the slope is more than 45 degrees. Secondly, there's nothing on it. And definitely they could not recommend anything what we could plant or make profitable. So we have to go on by our own. So what we did is we went around the place, see the crops available, and decide for ourselves. So what we did is that we saw that uh, we have to plant things which are resistant to diseases, and that's a very idea that I have. And something that would, uh, since we are far from the city and far from management-wise, we have to plant trees that cannot be harvested and sold locally in the domestic market. So we have to decide what kind of plants we have. So we decided with the right of selections of plant and trees, endemic in the areas, but need to be processed. Okay? So that's already one solution we have. We don't have problems with human, uh, with the human factor. And then after that, when we started planting already Bignai, uh, Alumpi, and all those other uh, wild trees, which are bearing fruits, we implemented this. We bought, definitely we all, we knew it as multiple cropping. We did it because it's very critical that we have to have a lot of trees around, different kinds, so that we could have a variety of plants around and not develop a disease in the area. After that, we also develop our farming system to control erosion. These things which we I learned or we learned from the university, so we practice control farming, we practice cover cropping. Here you would notice the lush greens that we have. Before, these were gullies. These were gullies, this one. And the soil and the water here flows together with the soil. So it's a terrible, it's really, you'll be displayed and uh, wonder why we still took this one with that big problem. But after several years of this program, you would notice now that if you go to this area, the water will flow down without any soil and a very clear water. It just proves that we were able to control the erosion. Here, we also felt that in order to succeed in the area, we should not only be concerned with ourselves. We must be concerned with the community. Because if we will be the only one who would be profiting from the area, then we might encounter some problems. So what we did, we implemented a cattle packing program, and we give technical and financial support for ginger and young production to the people. These people whose uh, work is a slash and burn business, we ask them to plant these trees. At the same time, plant also the wild trees that we have, while waiting for the uh, wild trees to bear fruits. Normally, we plant bear fruits in three years' time. So while waiting for the fruiting time, they are getting their profit, uh, their income from yam and uh, ginger and also the cattle fattening that people learn them. And then we also encourage people to plant 
our prescribed trees that we want. This is very important because the essence of their earning, earning their livelihood will depend on these trees. And these trees, and now the produce of these trees, we have a guarantee to purchase the produce at a guaranteed price. So this is a good come on for them. What we do is uh, we told them to grow trees for the short term, medium term, and long range program. The short term would be the ginger and young. The medium term would be the uh, plants from uh, uh, the big night plants, and lemons, wild lemons. We tell them that uh, with these trees, you will be harvesting in three years time. And for these small trees, say one tree of big night, it is capable of bearing 10 kilos. Just say, I said the minimum of 10 kilos. And at 20 pesos dollars in price, you could already earn 200 pesos per tree. So if you have 100 trees, you're up to earn 20,000 pesos. So this is how we do it. And then for the long term, we told them, you have to plant these big trees, which are also bearing fruits. And we will buy them also at the same price. Excuse me. But this one they have to use. They, have, they will not cut this for so many years. And we tell them, that these big trees, in 40 years' time, this is what you're going to give your grandchildren. These trees will grow into around and produce around 10,000 board feet. And these 10,000 board feet, the 30 pesos, would give you an earning for around 300,000 if only 30 pesos would be the cost after 40 years. So this is the legacy that you're going to give your grandchildren. And the people are very receptive to this uh, program. Now, we feel that it is not only important to give them a, this simple system. So, we try to educate also people in the community with supplemental livelihood. Those who still interested to earn more with each of us, be an organic farming. Our bee farming here, you would see, we teach them the very basic essence of producing queen, producing honey, and here you would see these are items from the dollar, which are the training in our area. We did this, unfortunately, or fortunately, with the people from Dinsu. So it's not from the University of the Philippines that we ask the assistance here. Six, what we also did is we feel that the future definitely will not be on the school people that we're talking with. We believe that the children would be a very important factor in our growth in the area. The children would be a very important factor. So what we did is we offer scholarships and improve the educational system in the area. This is through the help also of the University of the Philippines from our batchmates here in the university. So this one program that we are now starting to implement, probably this will be implemented this summer. But here, all the computers, I think this is the only school in the mountain that has a complete uh, technology, uh, uh, I mean computers in the uh, area, in the mountain. This is what we teach them so they would reach the world and learn everything globally. Now you would ask, what is the rationale of this program? This is very important because in order to succeed, you must have a very good reason. So it would keep you running and keep that flame in your heart and the passion to do things. We want to shift the paradigm of slash and barn farmers. We believe that slash and barn farmers are also having a hard time with this livelihood. So we teach, we want them to shift. We give them an alternative. Here, we want to, to educate them to the importance of cover crop. You know, in our area, when they clean their orchards or plants, they clean everything. They never try to care for the cover crop. Here, the cover crop, we taught them that the seeds of this cover crop could be harvested during summer and can be sold 
to some people who are in the animal industry as pets. Because in other countries like Thailand and other countries, this kalipukon uh, and centrosema doesn't bear flowers or fruits or seeds. So this is the only source that they have. And the seeds are bought to them at 100 to 150 pesos per kilo. We also encourage them to plant indigenous crops with economic and environmental value. In that area, normally, people wanted just to plant uh, ornamental plants and everything. We teach them the value that this would be a better alternative. Instead of planting all those things, we tell them to uh, plant malundai or whatever food and less about that's available. Here, we also try to control and manage for deeper birds and other animals. The main reason for this one is that we want to control and manage the birds. Before, when we came there, there were already no more birds around. You won't see any food you were there. Now, when our uh, big knife starts to fruit, a lot of birds, I don't know the name in uh, English, but we call it in Tagalog, Pulanga. Yeah. They, go, they come back here, and they start to devour on our fruits. But one thing nice about this is that when they started to grow into numbers, we allow our people, our staff, to gather them at night. And normally they are used as food. Normally they could harvest around 20 to 30 birds a night. So it also became a source of uh, food for them. And then for other animals, what we do is uh, we encourage them to catch seabed uh, cat. I know if you're familiar, the wild cat, seabed cat. Alamid, to catch them alive. And we pay them normally 200 pesos per life, seabed care. And then what we do is we release them in the mountain again. The main reason here is that this is also a source of food for the farmers, for the uh, mountain people. With this, they prefer to catch them alive because that's 200 pesos. And then what we do is that we encourage them to plant so this type of coffee, we allow them to plant. And we tell them, in three years' time, four years' time, you'll just be harvesting the manure of this uh, seeded cat. And it will give you a bigger, part, a bigger uh, price for it that one. Normally, if you're not familiar with seeded uh, <laughs> coffee, it costs around 5,000, 7,000 per kilo. So with this one, then looking forward to the future of just having earning better income from the coffee they're going to have. But they wanted a hard time to pick them and then just go there and pick them with you. And for maybe probably the rate now that's going in the areas that they pay around 2,000 pesos per kilo. So maybe in the next three years they'll be averaging around 300, 500 kilos because of the large uh, area that we really started planting. Fifth, we want to renew the people's interest and attitude towards tree planting. This is very critical. Our, uh, how would I say? Our people here from the university, from the government, had a lot of failure in the protection of the watershed area. All their reforestation project generally fails because they address tree planting as a way to replace the lost plants that have. They forgot that the people around needs money and to live. So what we teach these people are to plant trees that has economic value and whose return would be fast, which would give fast returns. So we teach them, like now, we have at least, uh, I think, seven hectares planted already to wild uh, banana, which we also use to process the fruits. We buy it directly from them on a contract basis. Six, we want to design a minimal management of indigenous management program for indigenous trees and plants. This is very critical. We should take note that the people in the mountain, the very reason that they are staying there, sad to say and sad to accept, 
are generally lazy. So we cannot change them so fast. So we have to adjust to the culture. How do we do it? We do it with this one. We have to have a minimal management program for things they plan, wherein they would get their income. I'll give you an example. For ginger, if they plant ginger today, after they cover it up with uh, coconut leaves and remove the grass, probably they will come back during our season. For young, ube, this is all the situation. Once it starts to grow and it starts to climb, they will just come back there when it's harvest season. So this is the way we try to work it out. Minimal work, but probably better profit. Here, we also teach them to practice, to practice multiple cropping for pest and disease management. This we do not tell them that it is for pest and disease management. We just tell them multiple cropping is important. So during the season of Big Nye, you have something to pick. During the, during the season of Palumpit, you have something to pick. During the season of these fruits, you have something to pick and sell. So this is how we introduce it to them. And lastly, we want to achieve an effective water conservation program. This is very important for us and for all of them. Why? Because in order to produce better crops, we need this water, and this water will be the most expensive commodity in the world in the next 10 years to come. So we have to protect it. Probably now, anyone who is drinking irregular water? Anybody? Or you all buy your water? Definitely you buy all your waters. So this is the main reason why. Probably the next 10 years, we do not protect our water. Reservoir, reservoir here in the Philippines will be buying more expensive water. Probably water will be more expensive than oil. So here, from the things that you saw, we were able to produce this right now. We have our own wine, we have our own honey, we have our own uh, tea, we have our own jam, we have our own animals, everything that we can utilize in the farm. We try to process them. And in that, I would like to tell you the importance of this one. Are you familiar with this one? This side? Have you seen this? Anyone? Oh, you could always see this. I, I thought if you never knew this. Uh, 1,000 pesos. Okay, so it's in the 1,000 pesos. So what's it? Anybody? What was this jar all about? Here in this system, when we try to produce these things, we also try also to encourage people, people who would patronize this, to know that the Philippines has its own culture. This is a Manunga jar, Manungu jar. This is a secondary burial jar for the old Filipinos. This jar was uh, discovered in a cave in uh, Palawan and after uh, carbon dating, it is around 650 to 750 BC. So this is one way to show and to let Filipinos, all of us, understand that the Filipinos have their own culture before all these Americans, all these Spanish, all these Chinese came here. So we should be proud of ourselves. That's why this is the main reason I believe that wine, this kind of wine, has been made since time immemorial. If you're familiar with the wine in uh, Mountain Province, who's familiar with the wine in Mountain Province? <coughs> but, no, that's a uh, Locos Basi. Apui. Therefore, if we know how to make that, then we understand we have our own science, we have our own technology. And here also you would know that we also have this label in a by buying form to translate all of this. To show people that Filipinos has their own culture from the start. 
Ganun tayong tarong ng mga araw pa. So we should be proud of our heritage. Well, anyway, this is how we want it to happen. People who try to patronize our wine and honey, you contribute to the livelihood in the education and everything. And preservation and sustainability of biodiversity. We never tell people that when you plant trees, you're going to protect the ozone layer, you gotta have a carbon credit, you gotta have a carbon dioxide uh, bring back to oxygen. We never teach them what environment is all about. We teach them, if you plant trees, you're going to eat tomorrow. You have something to put into your stomach, and to feed your children, and it be also a source of income, so you could send your school, to, you, you could uh, send your children to school. This is how we teach environment, and I think it's the most effective way of teaching environment. Teach them to live and to utilize what the environment gave them. Who is familiar with Genesis here? The Bible. Take note that when God created the earth, everything was in perfect order. It is only when man sin that they start to destroy what God has created for their own use. Pero mabay tayo Diyos. So, binigyan nila tayo ng talino, we were given the know-how, the knowledge to bring back what He has created. So that's how they are. It is for us. And this is how I believe things. So moving forward, what would be our respect, respective political roles in addressing the agricultural issues? Here. This is how we perceive things here. We have the government sector, which every sector should work for, and not the other way around. We believe that every academy, the private sector, the community, the business people should work hand in hand with the government. We should serve the government and not the government serving us. So this is an interaction between the four systems here. The academic researchers, the community, the private sector, and the government sector. What we are talking here is productivity. And we have to think globally. This is the most important thing. We should never, never keep knowledge to ourselves. Remember when you go out, this, to this, go out of this university and you have that knowledge, you, have, you should learn to share that because that's the main reason why you study. So others will learn. Now, this is how we set the roadmap of agricultural productivity. From the government sector, from the uh, academy and researchers, for the community and farmers, for the private sector. We believe that the government sector should formulate policies. They should not work on researches, on technology, but create policies for the risk for the people in the academy and for the private sector to be encouraged to go on research and develop. Secondly, we believe that the government through its organization should learn to create markets for the private sector and the community farmers. How? You should take note that we have the Department of Trade and Industry. This sector should learn to cooperate or to work together with the Department of Agriculture, if ever it's in the agricultural sector, the tourism industry, and the Department of Science and Technology. They should all work hand in hand to create products, encourage people from the business sector to go into economic uh, endeavor through their policies and their promises. Because you can, the Department of Agriculture, 
we probably we can produce everything we want, but there is no support from the DOST, and we will not be in, we, uh, the government will not help us to market globally through the Department of Trade Industry. We'll go nowhere. Here, the approach should be global. This is very, very important. If we want to achieve growth, we must think globally. This is what we believe. Here, the academic and the government sector should also work on them by making policies that would enhance, encourage the researchers and the academic to search for technology. For technology is the future. We cannot grow without technology. And the only source of technology, development of technology, is from the academic and the researchers. They should strengthen the education system, the researches they do, so they will be able to help and cascade this to the private sector and to the community sector. What do I mean? When research is in the government, I mean that it is done, and good results and futures are, and there's a future for all these uh, researches and development. They should be able to teach and to cascade them to the public sector, to the private sector and to the community. If they should not keep it in themselves into the four walls of their departments and make use of them by themselves. It should be cascaded to all people. That is how we can grow. And thirdly, they should closely monitor everything that's happening since they are in the academy. The students, definitely, has a very important role. You should always keep on reading and learning more from the four walls of this university. I tell you, that is the only way in which we could strengthen this country through knowledge, through technology. I would like to give you an, an example of what happened this, uh, after this morning when I attended the seminar on uh, growing uh, pangasius. When the speaker told us that they have a new technology of preserving fish, using code system and everything. I was shocked because that, te that technology was 40 years ago. Just think of that. We are working on 40 year old technology while other people are working on so new technology so they could bring their product into the market. Masyado na tayo malayo. Kaya everything will depend on the students, on the researchers for the development of technology. Now, what is the role of the private sector like us? We can act as professional managers. This is the best role that we can do. For every endeavor we do, we try to develop what is lost. We can create, we can change, but creation is the most important thing. Take note if I, I showed you earlier how much losses we have in the sea. Who among you knows uh, Professor Dr. Lulicus, Lourdes Cruz? Who knows her? Lourdes Cruz. You don't know? Anybody? Yes. Laureate yeah. Award. Laureate Award. So she's a Filipina, I think you know. Okay, she's the only Asian Dorian Awardee. She's a Filipina. She discovered an alternative, uh, what about this? Uh, alter an alternative product for like morphine, but it's not uh, morphine, similar to morphine, to remove pain. Do you know that it was discovered from a shell in the sea? We, our sea is already destroyed by 80 to 90 percent. If only we can develop what we found out and grow them domestically, <coughs> probably we will be creating another industry.
for people in the seaside. I, I hope you, you would be uh, aware of the people who are doing things for the country. These are few people that are doing things good for the country. Here, in the implementation, normally the business sector has the financial capacity to implement things, programs, which they which cascaded from the academy. And these actions, implementation, will depend highly on the government policies. So these are inter intersecting uh, institutions. That is our role, to implement <coughs> what this area has developed. And then, through that, through the policy of the government, we can stimulate economic, economic returns. How do we do that? Through these community farmers. We are talking here of the agricultural sector. What is important is empowerment. We, we should not leave them as mere farmers or workers. We should teach them, we should empower them that what they do is their own and they can survive by their own even though this sector would lead them. In the execution of programs, this is very important. With the help of the private sector, this one and this one, academic government sector, programs can be executed properly. Normally, programs are not executed properly because either there's a problem in the policy, the technology transfer was poor, or there was no support from the private sector. So if these three groups would only join hands, this program execution would be perfect. Third, we should learn to teach them cooperative, the cooperative approach. Nobody can live alone. If you are small, you need people to join together so you could implement something, you could read something. I'll give you an example. Why are we not competitive in the fit business? Because in the field business, you need more money to buy more to get it cheaper. But if you buy it all alone by yourself, it becomes more expensive because you buy less. If they could only form into groups, big groups, then they can always be competitive. This is the very essence of cooperative system. Productivity is very important here. The government should implement policies based on productivity. What do I mean? Policy should be based on productivity of every industry they have. Example, if you are talking of, uh, I hope Dr. Peñar is here, so, uh, Peñar is here, so I would uh, be able to understand. Our industry, pork industry, is 16 piglets per South Peru, so am I right? The government program should not be based on increasing sound, but the program should be increasing big lens. From 16, if you could raise it to 21, that is what you want for that TV. That should be the target. Set parameters. For the rice industry, for the plant industry, just for rice. We do not have to increase hectare age to produce a number of rice. Cabans of rice. What we have to improve is from 60 cabans of rice per hectare, we, they must have bring out policies to improve productivity to 90 or 100 cabans per hectare without increasing hectare age. That is a good government policy. A definite parameter for everything that you're going to produce should be based on productivity. It should not be based on volume or size. You may have the volume, but the profit is low, that's not good. You should always think of productivity. Even for students, they should, you should keep this in mind when you go out of this university. Never think of big things. Think of how productive you can be. That's a secret. So here, it is all based on productivity. 
All countries grew because of productivity. It's not because of the size. Take note of that. So with that, I'd like to end this uh, topic and uh, this talk, and I am open to questions. So as Sir said, the floor is now open to our audience to ask your questions or your comments. Please use the microphones around the room, introduce yourself and your organization. Any questions? Any questions from our audience? By the way, while we're waiting for questions, if you wish to look uh, more closely at Mr. De Anio's presentation, you can download the PDF version from the CIRCA website, starting Thursday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. De Anio. I am Dr. Maurice De Forrester, and uh, I worked for 11 years in Mindanao login. So, I would like to make some suggestions in your uh, rehabilitation of those uh, mountains or plants. No? First, there is what we call sloping agriculture, agricultural and technology developed in, uh, well, in southern Mindanao. Yeah. But I modify this where trees are concerned, forests are concerned. Since natural forests have four canopies, because if you have, as, 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 as is practiced now, we have only, we plant only one species in the same area at That's the same right. time. So we have only one canopy. That's right. So, uh, most of the water will uh, go down the earth and promote erosion. But if you have four dominant species, four dominant uh, canopies, yes. well, you increase the, what do you call this? Holding capacity. Capacity to, uh, to prevent the uh, rain. Yeah, portion the rain from yeah, going down. Four times. But in my case, uh, the, the top canopy was uh, a species used for electric poles, communication posts. At eight years, this cost us that 8,000 pesos per feet. The second canopy is Mandium for furniture. Our, my estimate was at 10 years to 15 years, it will now be approximately 3,000 per tree. And then, uh, no, 30,000 per tree, 10,000 to 30,000 per tree. And in Jimelina, the third canopy, uh, these are uh, species with big leaves and can live under uh, higher uh, the upper canopies. At about 10 years, this we, we, our estimate was it would be approximately 40 to 50,000 per tree. And then the last uh, canopy, the suppressed, uh, was Chibirina and uh, Albicia Palcantaria. This was for thinning. thinning. So that you don't have to cut the branches of the, the upper canopy trees. But this uh, Albicia Palcantaria can grow very fast and can survive under. Uh, trees, the big canopies. Uh, here, you can now uh, we notice that uh, we, the, the wildlife, the, 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 what? the birds, the monkeys, the deer, the pigs, the wild chicken, uh, uh, this came, came and uh, well, we have parties almost every day. <laughs> now, the second uh, suggestion is your creeks can be compartmentalized because there you have the free land, you have the free water. Well, uh, you can have fish. If you compartmentalize, compartmentalize the, the creeks, the shallow creeks, uh, instead of uh, what? using open land, you just uh, remove, because, uh, open the, the lower door, the apartment, the thing. You can you, you, you can have uh, all the fish you need for food and for probably in the market. Yes. And the third is uh, we plant now. I suggest you plant uh, bamboo. 
bamboos along the creeks because this this will protect the what is this, the, uh, the structure of the, the banks of the creeks and rivers. But I suggest you use now the technology uh, developed at Marcos Memorial State University instead of uh, pure uh, spiny, spiny, yung kawayan tini, you, 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 you plant bit in between bayo. Bayo, yeah. Because then you have, have uh, now you can produce charcoal for the livelihood of those uh, people out there. So, uh, and then for irrigation system, uh, interplant bananas. It's using the sloping agricultural technology, uh, in other words, you plant along, along the uh, perpendicular to the slope, such that in between the trees, rows of trees, you plant banana as well as a banana. And you have food and you have uh, fiber for sale. And uh, I think those people there will get rich. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, comments about that. That's a very good suggestion. But one thing nice when you put up a program, always consider especially community at its, as it, at its present state. It is very important to evaluate the people in the community. See, are they having enough uh, source of income from what they're doing? Second, if you know, you can implement longer programs. But if you see that the source of income of the people is so short or it's on a daily or regular or on a daily or two day basis. You need crops that is easily harvested and could be turned into uh, profit or money. It is very, very important. Take note. It is not easy to cut trees and put make them into charcoal. It is a hard work. It takes you several days or weeks to create charcoal. You cut. You dry into proper sizes, and then you put them there, put fire, and then cover them so air will not come, come in because it will turn, turn into ashes. And you wait for several days before it becomes charcoal. And it's so hard to cut trees, small trees. So these are the things that you have really to consider when working on communities in this kind of area. Because what is important to the people in this kind of community is what they are going to eat today and tomorrow and the following day. It is survival that is very important. If you forget this, anything you do within the area, definitely, it will not be a success. And you can see that, sad to say, with our watershed protection program, you can never be you can never succeed with that. Why? Because when you pay farmers to plant trees, they will plant trees. But after today, or three days later, they don't have any source of income again. So what would they do? Either they destroy the plant, so they would replant. That is the situation. Or plant them inverted, so they would be replanting program. And then, if you say it is well guarded, wait for several years, two years, three years, and then they go back again to this because the system is not sustainable. When you go into the system, always think how you can, the livelihood of the people be sustainable. As long as you do not have a sustainable program of livelihood for the people, you can never succeed. That's why I always say, I cannot be happy alone, they must also be happy. If I eat alone and they don't eat, probably they eat me the following day. So if they eat, if you eat today and they also eat today, you eat at the same time and having the same privilege, and then probably this country will not will grow faster. If you would only, like you've seen before, we have a negative three GDP. We have eight hundred thousand unemployed people. If only the private sector, through the better policy and better technology from the Academy would be implemented and the private sector would care for at least a hundred hectare each to develop an area like this and then it would be developing around a million hectares 
and giving probably livelihood to 75% or 600,000 people from the agricultural area. And probably the GDP would be positive already. So the approach would be always for the benefit of the community. Because this is the, com the community itself will make us survive. It is the same people, the community, that will create such things as what you call as communism, socialism, and everything. But the people are satisfied with the government, with the private sector, and the academy doing their thing. Probably this problem so what problem? Probably everybody will be satisfied because they will have equal opportunity. Right now we are not having an equal opportunity. The poor will have a hard time to grow. Take note of that. But if we develop this agricultural area, probably these farmers won't go to the city. They will work there, improve their lives. And we have already created, I would say, uh, not a perfect word, but a better word. Isn't it? Any question? Any more questions? Yes, for the Joe for that uh, for sharing a uh, very holistic program. I have some students here from the math uh, institute. Is there a place for math uh, students and math graduates to be? Uh, would you uh, have a place for Pahinood volunteers in your in your upland farm? Because we are encouraging uh, our UP students to live out the oblation spirit of serving the people. So. Uh, can we enter into an agreement with you? I am so already, yeah. I was late because I came from yeah, yeah, okay. So can we uh, come up with a structure for, let's say, practical yes, for okay. applied math uh, students and how we can help improve the production scheduling of the time wine, for instance, or the inventory, the uh, inventory model, or the sales? Uh, thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, I'd like to tell you that I've already talked with the principal of the Eastern Elementary School. I've already proposed your summer education for the children. I've also talked with them and introduced the uh, by buying system that they are going to patronize it and they are doing it. And the program of Pilar, it's already in, intact there. It's ready for implementation. It's only for you to tell me, let's go. You know, I really did it as fast as I could. I talked with the principal, with the Barangay uh, captain. So we would really help this community. As a matter of fact, I'd like to tell you that this, I want this to be a model community. Because this is on top, almost on, on the top of the mountain, and the road that way. And you would see that children would be going to school. Mga siguro, one community is around the one kilometer away. It's in the mountain. And uh, it's not nice to say, but you know, because it's so far from the city or from the from the main barrio, that some cases incest has already occurred in that area because of lack of education and everything. So any help in education, in anything, is always welcome. Because uh, who knows, this, this town one day may be known as the area where they would learn and see what my buy is all about, where we started from. And it's, it's a pride to say that it happened because of the UPLB people. Thank you very much, Alelia. Yeah. Yeah, Can okay, we have one time for one last question? Yes, please. Another classmate, <laughs> um, Sergio. Yeah. You know, when when we knew you then, we wouldn't know you would be in, in this kind of thing, right? <laughs> and uh, actually, that's what we need, right? Uh, entrepreneurs, because 
you know, there's like four kinds of people in this world. It's like we have the labor, you know, they, they actualize things, they work. We have the warriors who can see the conflict and become faithful, whatever, and defend territory. We have the intellectuals, and I think that the academy belongs to that. But then they say that the higher, higher consciousness, higher intelligence is the merchant. <laughs> because they, he can see through the, the three kinds, and he can he sell to them, he can make them buy, or, you know. And, and I think that's what's severely lacking here in, in the academy, the entrepreneurship mentality. Uh, in other universities, they have their real research, you know, actual enterprise, like that. And um, I think also that we should have that kind of thing. But of course, merchant or commerce with morality, right? Definitely, that's 100%. Yes, and, and we need to have those. How do we develop students like you, you know, you have the commerce, the consciousness, and also that, that morality. Uh, do you want to answer me the way I feel or the way I think? Both. 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 Both? Yes. If I would say the way I feel, uh, think more, think more. <laughs> to tell you honestly, the, the most important thing in education is what you see from your instructors, from the head of the academics. They are the best example of what you're going to be in the next year. Pag nakakita kayo ng corrupt na instructor, probably isipin niyo pag laki ko gusto ko rin magiging ganyan. Marami siyang pera. But if you see people, uh, how do you say, your professors have a heart, probably when you go out of this university, you think kayo may puso rin ganyan. Now, yun ang mga mong sagot, galing sa puso. Ayan. Masaya to. Dito sa university, maraming matalino. They bred a lot of intelligent people. Many technology has come up from this university. The problem is, it could not cascade to the students or to the business sector. They feel that the knowledge they learn and the researches they have done is, the, is to themselves alone. That's the worst part of it. Only if only professors and researchers would do their work and think properly about the improvement of this country, and then probably they would teach everyone. So more would learn from them. That is the secret of Israel. You know, I was talking with Dr. Samberg. He is one of those who uh, discovered a disease in Poultry Island. When I asked him, why, why are you so concerned with so, such work? And I just concentrate to be earning more money because you know that you can create more and have more money from, from the things that you have discovered. You know how he answered me? Joe, here in Israel, we study so others will learn. And I said, then how can your country defend with so much little population against the Arabs? You know what they told me? We only have 5 million population. But we have 5 million soldiers. I just want to tell you, na ganun sila. Without nationalism, wala. Kaya ngayon na ano ko yung ano natin, uh, the main reason, kinaano ko yung this one, itong baybay, gusto ko magising din tayo eh. This is just a wake up call. We have our own future. Diba? Siguro pagka alam natin may sarili tayong kultura, we have our own heritage. That's the time we will think of our content properly. Okay? Yeah. Thank you.